his uh, topic, of course, is cello. And he'll, uh, he's, I know he's done a lot of preparation on this. Uh, we, first we thought of the opaque projector, and we went to the overhead, and we finally have some things all set. So, Fritz, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Fleming, for inviting me to uh, talk about cello tonight. And I see some of the gentlemen who took their coat up. May I be permitted to do the same? I can play the cello better. Sure thing. Thank you. Uh, what I propose to talk about tonight is not music, but just simply the fun fundamentals of cello technique. And I do not have to dwell on things which are similar to the violin technique because most of you know much more about that subject than I ever will. So uh, we have, I have prepared the thing so it will not take over long because to talk about this subject you could sit here all night and more. But you can also not expect to get everything in, or learn to play the cello in one easy hour. So I try, try, I will try to just cover the fundamentals and maybe the teachers who teach string in school may get something out of it. Now, what <clears throat> there have been books written about this subject, and I have two here. One is uh, written quite extensively, even it's called Mechanics and Aesthetics of Playing Cello, but it is in German. So for anybody of you who reads German, it's welcome to, to look over these books. The second one is by a, a man who has studied with Casals. His name is Morris Eisenberg. This one is in English, it's called Cello Playing of Today. This is kind of not, I would say, old fashioned, but not very up to date. This one is more up to date and in, contains a lot of interesting material. Uh, the only drawback is, is it costs $12.50. This is not my book. Uh, I borrowed it from a friend. So, I will try to talk about things which I cannot find in books tonight. And maybe some of this you may have seen. If you have, please let me know. Now, the right hand technique for the cello is exactly the same has the same problems as for playing the violin. To put it simply, to draw a bow straight across the string at a vertical angle. That's just as simple as you can put it. But there, since there are four strings, you have this problem four times at a different plane. Now, in my hometown was a old violin teacher who happened to be my uncle and he invented a gadget for which I have heard it's even used here too and commercially available but I tried to reproduce this gadget the way I remember it from way back and I have it here The, these poor students of my uncle were subjected to this thing here. They had to, while he was teaching one in class and he played music, the other one had to do this here. To get a straight bow arm. 
Now, with all due respect to my late uncle, I think this is not the right approach because you can, a hundred times, you can get your arm moving or being moved by this gadget this way. And I don't think you will, you will accomplish anything. So this is, in my opinion, the thing starting backwards. Now you have also the problem you have four, you would have to have this thing movable so you can, on the E string, you can do different. But I always recommend is to, uh, to just sit in front of a mirror and uh, just try to see whether you do this. Many students, when they start playing, they go like this, this thing. Well, now, if you, if you just do it with your arm, that's all. I, I cannot see any mechanical gadget which will produce a straight line than just practice it in front of a mirror. Can we have the first slide, please? You thought I would talk about cello, but this is your car, and uh, you have the same problem in reverse in playing the cello as you have in, in uh, operating an automobile. The, uh, you convert straight line motion into rotary motion from the piston to the crankshaft. Next, please. I hope you can see it. We couldn't get it any clearer, but uh, it's the best we can do. The sho shoulder <clears throat> and elbow are shown as links, and the straight line is better approximated if you have a large radius. So you see the large radius swung around the shoulder, and that is when you play with the ball in the lower half. You have to move this thing, because if you don't, this will be resolved. Next, please. On the other hand, when you come past the middle of the bow, you must use this one for detaché. <laughs> So the whole thing is a combination of shoulder link and elbow link. And as I said, the mirror will tell you whether you are drawing it straight or crooked. Now on the C string, it's better to pull back to get it back. And on the A string, the opposite, push the bow forward as far as you can. Next, please. <laughs> to hold the bow, these pictures are taken from the duck tower method. To hold the bow, I tell my students to take the two fingers, middle finger and uh, thumb, and wrap it around the stick here just slap the other on. Now, people who have played the violin, they still have in their ear their teacher yelling at them, put the pinky on the ball. Now, we cellists tell the students, don't put the pinky on the ball, because that will give you a crooked approach. And as you see, this is correct. Just the fingers square to the bow. Next, please. I like to now talk a little bit about the left hand, which of course is quite different in technique from the violin. 
But one thing we can learn from the violinist is the way we put the fingers on the string. And if you look at the left hand picture, you see that the fingers are not put in square, but at a slight angle. The reason is very simple. For intonation, if you want to move your third finger, it is very hard to do this. If you want to try this, if you want to move this third finger this way, it's almost impossible. However, if you put it this way, you have the leeway of moving it downwards and then creating a bigger distance here. Now we have two, it shows two important uh, positions which we can discuss later on in detail. This we call the regular position and then by only moving this, the uh, first finger and leaving everything as it is, as you see in the picture, we get the extended position. That I have, a yeah. Question there, and when you go to the point finger, should all fingers be done on the fingerboard? Right, right. Keep in all, yeah, in those, in those two, please ask questions. I, I hope I can answer them. Uh, in all these, either regular or extended positions, you keep the fingers down at the fingerboard. Now, if you have the, the angled approach, as I said, which is good for getting your intonation clean, then necessarily the fourth finger must be stretched. And also it's a good practice when you talk about left-hand technique to, uh, to get strong fingers by hammering the fingers on the string. That's shown at the next picture. And these pictures are taken, or this one is taken from, from this book. It's not too good a reproduction, but you can see that the man opens his hand and, and does this. And many students, especially in shifts, will do this when they should do this. The next picture shows a pretty girl not too well. Can you get it, Shama? Well, this, this is a concert cellist, and you can see from the position of the fingers that what I said, uh, she observes too, to put the fingers in. I would say that most of the great cellists play that way. My teacher Piatigorsky played that way. He didn't play this way, and I can show you later why. Uh, Leonard Rose plays this way. Don McCall, who's the cellist of the Lennox Quartet, plays that way. And I think for this reason, which I mentioned, it is the best approach for normal hands. We have one more picture to show before we go into a little more detail. And this is the position of the thumb. When you play with the thumb here, this is not uh, part of elementary teaching, but just to complete it, the thumb should be on, uh, at right angle to the string and produce a fifth. We would like to talk now about, yes. Does the thumb extend over the other? Yes. If you're playing on the A string, your thumb should be over the D string. Right? This doesn't move. Uh, I would like to discuss now the positions a little bit in detail. <clears throat> the regular position <clears throat> covers 
one and a half steps. In other words, it can go or it covers three notes and uh, this is a summary, we get this uh, a little bit more in detail. Then we have the extended position, which takes two steps, two full steps, and the double extension. Let's get into the next uh, slide, please. The first problem with young students <coughs> occurs if they find that they can't find their first note. Uh, I have read in this book, I believe, it's Casals, who says, I'm 90 years old, and every morning I have to find my E on the D string. Because many times the student will do this, and even if he has found it, he will go like this. You see, he takes the finger off instead of keeping it. Oh, by the way, speaking of Casals being 90 years old, I don't know whether you have heard that little story which went around in Marlboro where he conducted. He, when he was a young boy of 80, he married a girl of 20. And then 10 years later, he and his wife, he 90 and she 30, were in Marlboro, Vermont, conducting, was conducting, and her mother, who is about 50, came to visit. And people asked her, uh, uh, you enjoying the festival here, the concerts? She said, no, I just came to visit the children. <laughs> Uh, this is now the regular position which has covers one and a half steps. In other words, one and a half or a half and one. Now, again, as I say, to find the first note, you should always encourage the students to go from the open string and I tell them to get out there, say, in outer space, and come down and see whether you can hit it. Right? This takes practice. Now, uh, I have next a uh, little musical example to, to show you. This is uh, <clears throat> taken from the Dutzauer book, and uh, you see the first four notes, the way it's played. If you don't do this, it sounds like this. I'm exaggerating, mind you. But if you do this, I'm exaggerating even the position. It doesn't have to be that. But just to show you the difference, what happens. If you do this, then you would have to move this over, and you need your right hand for, for playing on the string. So you can't do that. So this way, you go. So this little exercise is very valuable for getting the intonation clean. Next, please. <clears throat> this picture shows the same regular position in all positions from first to the fourth. In other words, on the left side is a half step. You look down, you have a half step, 
and one step, which is fingers one, two, four. And on the right side you have one step and a half and you play and so on. Now, I know that in violin playing you have to know your positions and you have to study the positions this is being done in the dot sour method too and other method i do not believe it is necessary to know in which position you are if you only learn to have uh, if the students learns to hear intervals if he knows that uh, that's a whole step, or if he knows that there's a minor third, and then you uh, could put it this way, you have to be able to play every note with every finger. Now, if you play that A flat with a third, then the D flat is with the first. I do not think it serves any purpose to dwell and forcing the students to know that when you... Uh, David Sawyer, I talked once, he doesn't know what position he said. I know when I am in fourth and in first. But in between, it really doesn't make any difference. Let's take the extended position now. <clears throat> In the extended position, as you see from the right-hand picture, it's just uh, graphically simplified what you saw before on the screen. And the extension on cello means only the first finger. Extension means only first finger stretching and you leave everything here alone. It even <clears throat> applies to a thing which you come to later, which is one more half step on occasion. So you have one, two, four, and again, you have only, can only play three notes. And keep, stretch the first finger and keep the first finger on the st string. Next picture, please. <coughs> Taking this over two strings, it's like this, over all positions up to the fourth, mind you. And it covers two full steps. Now, when, when I say you should know the intervals, the relative intervals, no matter in what position you're playing, we can show you this a little bit in, on, a, on a table. Next, please. You want to play intervals on two strings without any shift, no shifts. <clears throat> you can not do a half step. In fact, I can. <laughs> almost impossible but you can do a what we call double extension you can do a full step whole step or major second
When we do this, we should not force our hand to keep all the notes on the string. This is the exception. It, uh, the next one is the regular extension, minor third. Then comes the major third. <coughs> the fourth, which you can play either with a 3-1 or an extension 2-1. And the fifth. And the uh, diminished fifth. Let's take the next table, which goes on to six, and the fifth you have again here. Mind you, you can start this any place. You can start it with a G or with the A. I have marked it here starting with the F. Minor six. Min uh, major six. Again, this major six can be played two ways. Or minor sevens extension, because there's actually two full steps in. And uh, the octave, which would be a, a super extension. And here, usually, we take the finger off because we may get a cramp. But we can reach it. There's a very nice, simple rule you can have. I have never seen that in a book either for thirds. If you play a third on one string, C, E, for instance, major third, major third, major hand. In other words, major hand or extended, minor third, regular, 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 extended. Now this is all we do, if we play in orchestra, all we do is constantly do this or that. Uh, on two strings, the thing is reversed. This is a major third because it is and that's a regular position. In other words, big third, small hand. Minor third, big hand. <laughs> okay, now the uh, <coughs> what we talked about so far is playing cello without shifting. And it is really pitiful that we have to have a technique like this, but if the cello was tuned in fourth, it would be probably easier to play. But it is not, and so as you see, we can we can only play three notes in in any position. Would you show the next slide, please? Here I show, for instance, a piece in C major where you have only in the fourth position. And the in-between notes you cannot have, so you have to sing them. Da, da, da. It would be a nice concert if you played that way. And people like Mr. Dotsauer forced their students to play in this position alone. In other words, using these three fingers with a variation of the third. 
let me just play you an example of what comes, what kind of music comes out of this. Too silly. F major, let's go to the next one. F major, <coughs> there, this is again teaching them the fourth position. Again, uh, 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 uh. and the piece he composed for this occasion is a little bit nicer, but still it is avoiding the connecting notes, and that was, makes it tough musically. So we are forced to go to shifts and the next slide shows you a little example of just minor shifts, a half tone or a See here, here you have to go You have to shift a half tone. And he carries that out. Next slide, please. Uh, and when he comes to the, I don't even know which position, I think the second, then he does the whole thing again in a different key, which is just a repetition. <laughs> of a half tone because uh, without the shift it would be a second finger and then you would get in trouble and you can't move paint yourself into a corner the double extension as I mentioned before is shown here and it is used to avoid unnecessary shifts <clears throat> And uh, in other words, when you have sometimes or on the on the A string, to avoid this thing, well, you can reach it, but stretch the first finger more than in an extension, but do not keep on the string. Relax. Uh, next uh, slide shows you where you can uh, make use of this device. Now, I can show you the, the fingering should always correspond with good phrasing, and if you would follow the old method which teaches the student first position and fourth position, <clears throat> then, then you would get this. This uh, example is from a cello duet by Jax Offenbach. You see, you have to, even if you take the fourth finger on the second bar, you have to shift back and forth. Now you can avoid this very nicely if you, if you use the double extension for just the first finger, mind you, it is very hard to extend third and fourth finger. If you use that and start the first note, Uh, 
all the all the notes are there. And I don't keep the finger on the string and I relax. Make sense? I hope. Okay. Now I want to show you some more of the way we would like to play, but we can't. Let's take scales. We can only, believe it or not, only play in the first position two scales without shifting. And that is pretty pitiful. Uh, the main, one of the main things you have to learn in cello playing then will be shifting because without you are lost. So you can play the C major scale as it's shown there in two octaves. And you can do the D major scale in two octaves just by grace of the open strings. Das ist alles. Now, the next slide will show you what can you do in one octave. But yet, there you are limited to. I, if anybody wants to contest my statement, he's welcome. But I can only find five scales, B e flat, F, G, a and B flat, which can be played in the first position without shifting. Now, in, in higher positions, even worse, because there you don't have open strings to contend with. You have only three notes you have to sing. So you can only play five. Now, this is two, two, and five is seven. However, according to the Nisma book, the students have to know 15 scales when they go in sixth grade. I never quite understand where they, the 15 comes from, because we all know from Arnold Schoenberg that there are only 12 scales. And uh, can we have the next, yeah. The next slide shows you these 12 scales as they are needed with a fingering in one octave for the Nisma contest. I still think there are only, I mean, I know there are only 12 scales and not 15. If you enharmonically change this, a G flat scale to a F sharp scale, the fingering still remains the same, at least on the cello. Uh, I like to talk a little bit about shifts now. And we have short shifts and long shifts. Uh, the uh, usual shift which the student learns is from first to fourth positions. Actually, that's the worst shift he can do because he has to move his whole hand up here. As close as possible is good and 4-1 is bad, but if you contract your hand and you approach that, you can make it a little easier. Now, I do not uh, say that we should not use this shift ever, but it should correspond with a phrasing whenever it's, for instance, you have the C major scale on the A string. That's the usual way to play it, and that's how it's being taught. A 
what about this when it is in a different rhythm? For instance, then all these shifts come on the wrong time. So this is not a, a sacred cow. This should then be changed to this fingering. Especially when you have accents on the notes. Two notes of which one is accented, the other one is unaccented. You should not put the shift on the unaccented note. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, the long shifts, I would recommend avoiding, avoiding the same finger. We are taught, taught to practice this thing too. But it is always better to use slide with the last finger and hit the next one. It gives you a and there's this is what we could call the standard way of learning, but there are occasions where you want to put your fingers on the string and do it this way, as is shown in no number two. That gives you a smooth gliding into the note. I think it was called the hyphen shift. I do it this way. I start out my journey with this last finger and gradually put the others on. There's a piece by Schubert, the quartet G major, where there is a, a jump from Now here I would even forget all of this. No matter how you do it, it will sound bad. Either way, one or two, so why not go with the string? These shifts are, uh, are dealt with in the cello method and one main thing, I mean, if you do this kind of, oh, you can't read this, can you? This is not too, well, it just shows exercises in shifting this. All that stuff. But the main thing is you have to uh, practice these shifts up and down or down and up. For this reason, both hands go this way when you get. So they go this way. It is not said that you can do the same thing in up bow because then the hands go this way and your nervous system will not maybe... You have to practice every shift This is slow motion. First standard way of shifting. Last finger goes, the next one slaps it on. <coughs> A little trick which I think was invented by Feuermann. When you go back, <coughs> a little pizzicato with the fourth finger. Make it make it sound uh, more accurate. Next, please. Now, there are many, many occasions, <clears throat> and I don't know why this is never dealt with in the books, is as much easier to contract a hand than to extend it unduly. So you, sh uh, you have 
uh, phrases where you better use the uh, ability of making your hands small. Let me play what I have there. I play it in the standard way without uh, contracting or changing your hand. Then you will have this. Bad shift. Bad shift. Now I play it the way it's written, and you know this little C means contraction. Look. The same way up, if you have this kind of note pattern. Now, here it would be in the standard way. Bad shift. So I play it right away as I have marked it in fingering here. Every time you come to a new triplet, you do contraction or you have. Uh, thirds to play. I always tell my, I call this, when I teach, I call this caterpillar fingering, like a caterpillar works. Here is a very nice example uh, from the Arpeggione Sonata by Schubert, which uses extension, <coughs> contraction, and double extension. I can do it slowly for you, but if you have questions, please ask. That's extension. Contraction, double extend, because that third Usually is not played with two one. This would be called double extension. Next, please. Vibrato. Mm -hmm. uh, I never teach vibrato because I have found, or I believe, I only tell them to try and I tell them how to try. I do not teach a certain way. What comes out when you finally play vibrato is a rotary motion around this pivot. But if you try to teach a child to do this, they will never get a vibrato, never. I am convinced that if the student tries to do this downwards, eventually this will result. 